Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome on the Culture News. My name is David Cerrero, and I have the pleasure to have today over the phone a legend. He is absolutely amazing. He's one of the greatest composers of all time. You name it, he was nominated in everything. He won everything. He wrote one of the most beautiful musicals, most beautiful music of all time. This is the one and only the one and only my dear friend, one person I love very much, Mr. Maori Yeston. Maori, how are you? <laughs> I'm just fine. Oh, you really, that's uh, that's too much overpraise. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> well, but, you deserve every bit well, of it. Uh, thank so, you very much. <laughs> so the first question I would like to, to, to ask you, how did you start your your career in music? Like what brought you to become a musician in the first place? You know, that, that's a very, very easy answer. You know, um, Hindemith said that the greatest training in music in the world is family singing. And from the very moment I, 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 I was on this earth, all I can remember is all of everybody in my family sang. My father was uh, a Jewish family uh, originally from Poland that emigrated to London. So my dad was raised in London. So he was British Yiddish and he sang English musical So Don't go down to the mines, dad. You, you know, uh, uh, don't jump off the roof, dad. You'll make a hole in the yard. Mothers planted petunias. The weeding and seeding were hard. So you're hearing that from your dad. Those songs, but he also sang Yiddish songs. The voice is going is going is nishdu. From from the time I was a little boy, my mother's father was a cantor in the synagogue, and so from the moment I was sitting on my grandmother's lap in the ladies' section of the Orthodox synagogue, looking down, there would be my my grandfather on Yom Kippur uh, would be standing on a bima. A bima is a raised platform. He's standing in front of a huge congregation. That's an audience. He's staying on a raised platform. He's, he's wearing a white robe. It's called a kittle, right? He's in a costume. A man on a, on a, on a, raised up in a costume, singing at the top of his lungs, right? Emoting. That's a musical. It's one step from that to a man on stage in a costume singing to a... So from the moment I was sitting on my grandmother's lap before I could even speak, that to me was a normal experience. And there's an unbroken line from my doing that to uh, where I am now. And then it was the 1950s and the early 1960s again, and it was really the birth of modern jazz. And I started playing jazz and I started playing jazz uh, in black church basements. It's so inspiring because when I moved to, uh, to, to, to America and I discovered musicals, people told me, you know, musical is meeting the Yiddish operetta with jazz music. Very much, yes. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. So, so you actually, your whole path is truly the definition of what musicals are. But what do you find that is so attractive in musicals that perhaps you don't find writing jazz tunes, by example. Uh, well, you can use jazz in, in musicals where they're appropriate, because don't forget that, 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 that musical theater is American music, and it's so many of the great songwriters from Harold Darlin, to all the, all the, had cantors in their family, in the same way that my grandfather was a cantor, they had cantors in the family. And so they grew up on that incredibly emotive, expressive, beautiful, in some cases, mournful kind of music. So you will say actually that musicals is perhaps the, the true language of, of freedom and the true language yes. of what America is because it's the melting pot of all these knowledges that are coming from all around the world and right. around their cultures to create musicals. Is that that's what right. you think it is? That, that's exactly right. That's where it comes from. Yeah, that's where it comes from. As more and more immigrant populations come into America and all of their backgrounds, they join the great, they, they're like rivulets coming into a great stream and the great river of American music continues and we just keep adding to it. 
So the question I have for you, Maury. So fast forwarding, you wrote what I think is one of the most beautiful musicals of all time, Phantom, which is based on the novel of a Phantom of the Opera um, in over a thousand productions, I've been and told. That, yes, uh, very much, yeah. So in, in this musical, before we start to talk about Titanic that is playing now in movie theaters, please go to see it. Actually, the whole Yiddish point is makes sense to me because there is this cantorial in the song uh, uh, without music. Uh, yes. This cantorial thing, resonance that perhaps you were even looking for from the singers, but also these very sensitive notes that you go uh, to, to, to search. What is going on in your mind, Maori, when you are writing music first of all do you sit and say okay i need to write a musical or how does it start for you what is your process of composing very, first of all first since i grew up at loving musicals right and from everything from alan j Lerner to stephen sondheim right i love the form and also i love not only writing a a song all by itself a pop tune or something like that but i love telling stories in music and I, I love, I love, in fact, my, my musicals are really song cycles. If you just listen to the music, from what you, we could tell the whole, I can tell you a whole story in music. You know, I mean, we just released the, the December song for uh, Victoria Clark, right? And, and that's a song cycle. Uh, classical composers uh, invented, Beethoven invented the song cycle. Uh, my, I'm a storyteller in music and I can do it just with a group of songs. Or we can take a group of songs and put it on a stage. But a song happens in, in, in on stage in a musical. Songs happen in musicals where, where exclamations happen in language. In other words, you sing when you're so filled with emotion that you can no longer speak and you must sing. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Right there. See? And that that that's gotta be a song. I, I just feel a natural inclination. To, to have somebody, a character in a situation who, who becomes so filled with emotion that he or she can no longer speak and they have to sing to express their feelings, whether they're happy, whether they're sad, whether they're angry, whether they have to tell you something. And so I just have this natural synchronization that gets the best out of me. A, a man who, who just, he's a genius and he's a film director, but he, he, but he, and he wants to have that person and that person and his wife and his mistress and this and that, and he wants to do this, but he wants to do that. And he's just all over the place. So he's, I want to be here. I want to be there. I want to be everywhere at once. And that becomes Guido's song. Or, or um, um, well, the Phantom. It, so when I, I think about, well, what would be a good story? What's a character, right? Because, because you can't put anything on a stage unless you have a, a person who you care about. And of course, I always find that the center of a, of a musical is on the basis of what I've seen in my life, usually works out well if it's focused and centered on a, a literary character, a fictional character, unique to literary fiction. Henry Higgins would be a good example, right? He's just Henry Higgins, isn't he? Uh, and so, and we got Tevye, right? Who's like Tevye? He's, and so, and so when I thought about Phantom, and of course, first thing I thought was worst idea in the world, right? First of all, it's a horror story. Why, 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 why did you think it was the worst idea? Was there already that thing with uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber? Oh, no, 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 no. Well, he yet. and I were completely independent of that. We, we yeah, both, yeah. right? You know, and we, the question of who started writing it first and who had a, a, who had a quicker route to get it on the stage. Andrew's show got on first, all, power, all, all glory to him. I, you know, I, my show is done everywhere. It, it, we're just two different people who wrote two different things. We're not the first two composers who ever sort of had the same oh, idea. Of course, of course. Yeah. So, yeah. and so, but for me then, I was all alone and thinking, how, well, do I really want to write this? And I thought, well, well, it's a ridiculous idea. It's a horror movie. What am I going to do next? Mothra meets Godzilla, the musical? <laughs> you know, makes no sense. And yeah. then I thought, well, well, wait a minute. What is, who is this man? All right, so he is a man who was born so misshapen, so ugly, so hideous, you couldn't even look at him. It, it, it was horrible. 
And so he had to be hidden away. His mother could, nobody could let him be seen. And as he grew up, he was simply surrounded by his own ugliness. He couldn't look in a mirror, a little child. As he grew up, he realized that he, he was monstrous to look at. And all he had in his life, he was growing up, he found one thing to love, music. Only the beauty of music. So here's the ugliest creature in the world who lives for only one thing, the only thing that can enter his life that can bring him succor and beauty is the beauty of music. And so wow. he falls in love with opera and he finds an environment deep down below, because he can't sit in the audience, deep down below in the crypts of the opera, which is ugly underground caves with reptiles, <laughs> who knows what's going on down there, but he can be down there. And the voices of the magnificent sopranos in the orchestra come wafting, wafting down through the bottom of the stage, right below that, all the way down into the crypt where he is and brings him beauty. And so th there's a, there he is right there. And, and so try to imagine one day when he's down there and oh, and excuse me, because he's living down below the opera house in this hideous, horrible environment, he steals scenery from the beautiful scenery up above and he decorates his cave with the most magnificent scenery in the world. He's got the, he's got the, he's got the, uh, the concert hall from Lohengrin. <laughs> he's got the bedroom from, from, from Verdi. And so he lives surrounded by the beauty of, 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 of scenery and the glory of the music down. And one day something happens in the opera and they want to fire, uh, fire the, uh, uh, the guy who's in charge of it. And all of a sudden, Everything, the only thing that he has that he can that he can live on becomes threatened. And he has to do something about that. Hence his violence that comes. And so I thought that is a man you cry for. He's a beautiful man on the inside and hideous on the outside. And as horrible that he looks, that's how beauty, beautiful is the music that sustains him. And I thought. That's a, that's a story. How do you know, Maori, that when you have it, how do you know when, when you're like, okay, I have a musical with this. Do you do some tryouts? No, I, no, you, no. How no. does it work? How, how do I know? I write yeah. something. I write something. Way before tryouts, I write something. And if I, if, if I write something and I go, wow, that really, that, I love that. I've written something really meaningful to me then I know that this subject matter and thinking about it and feeling about it is getting my best work out of me. And then I keep writing it. So I write it. And then I have the score and the story and I find somebody to work with in terms of telling the story. And then now there's something that we can talk about putting on a stage. So, but oh, it always begins with my seducing myself by thinking about it deeply and then being moved to write something. And if I can write something beautiful and something funny and something that tells the story, then what's going to uh, uh, what intrigue people and, and bring them into the idea of putting this on a stage, right? Once I find a collaborator to work with. And so, but it's, you see, it's all built from the, the beginning from there. Uh, here's another example. So now um, I, I, I thought a great deal about uh, uh, some of the some of the events that have always been one of the greatest events that are universally known all over the world. For example, like the history of the Titanic. And I was thinking, there's something about that story that's monumental. Uh, everybody knows about it. It's the most it's the it's the most well known word in in on the world. Every language, everybody knows that word, Titanic. It's the worst. It's the worst disaster in history. Of a thousand people died, huge maritime disaster. And I kept thinking, why is it that I feel that, that somehow that story sings to me? Very that, interesting what you said. That the, the story must sing. Yes. If it doesn't, if it doesn't sing to me, then I then I, I don't think of it as a musical. You know, I mean, 
I guess you could make a musical almost about almost anything, but I think it's always great when you have an idea that people go, well, how could that possibly be a musical? And then if you pull it off, they go, oh my God, they made, they made a musical out of that. And by the way, that's me. I go, well, that can't happen. And then I think about it. And if I come up with something, I go, oh my God, that, maybe that can be a musical. And so I started thinking about this story about the Titanic. And, you know, and people, oh, that's the worst idea in the world. What, you, you want to do, a, a, you want to sing about the worst maritime disaster in, disaster in history? Mm -hmm. Are you out of your mind? And then I thought a lot about it I, 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 during a specific period of time that will become obvious to you once I tell you the rest of the story. And so uh, I thought, well, look, why did they build that ship? Who built the ship? All right, so it was built, the, it was built at the apex of the British Empire. England ruled the seas, right? Everything, you couldn't get any, anything anywhere. You couldn't go anywhere, uh, send anything if you weren't on a British ship. And they were the greatest ships in the world and the most advanced maritime technology in the world, right? They were not only at the end of the 19th century, uh, they ruled, ruled the waves and one of the greatest empires on the earth, but they also had the best technology, the, the English Industrial Revolution, from the cotton gin all the way through to their machines, they were the, the apex of world technology. So they thought the worst thing that can happen, the, 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 the disaster ha can happen when a ship sinks and people die. And so why don't we, at the apex of human technology, with the greatest empire in the world, and the greatest maritime emperor, can we build a ship that cannot sink? Imagine the idea of a ship that cannot sink will, will prevent the, the endless loss of life on the sea that we had historically. And so they set about to, on a project that will save human life, a project that will advance technology, a project that will stretch our ability and our technology to go places. And so they had a dream, a positive dream. And I thought, that's something to write about if we dream. Jonas Salk dreamed of, of a vaccine that, that could prevent polio. And look at the lives that he saved because of it. And how were these people dreaming about the Titanic any different? And I thought, that's a dream. That's something positive. Yes, we failed, but we dreamed and we meant well. And as I was thinking about that, I swear to God, I would never make this up. As I was sitting in my little apartment thinking about that, the space shuttle Challenger blew up right above my head. Wow. Those, those three astronauts lost their lives mm. in, in the, on the, one of the greatest... Uh, manufactured objects of technology in the history of the human race. Yeah. With the greatest engineering and brilliance and perfection on, on a great dream of a journey to explore space for betterment of mankind. But we dream and sometimes we fail. And I thought, aha, we've learned nothing yet, or we keep have to relearning it. And that's a story I want to tell. It and is. I sat down and started writing it. And, and, and so you have that story that is uh, kind of a, uh, getting designed in your head. Yes. But what is also your particularity is that inside the big, the large story, you create small stories, right? Yes. You create and you bring so much data in, in the vocals, in the line, in, yeah. the, in the melody, like right away, you know, okay, that guy is the guy who is like this. This is the, the, the shy guy. This is That's the right. funny guy. How do you do all of that? Uh, well, here, well for the first question I ask always is, who am I in this story? Mm, you know, the first uh, question I have for our interview, I forgot to ask it because I was so happy yeah. to see you, is who are you? You know? Yeah, okay, well, who am I? So I said to myself, okay, well, if I'm in this story of the Titanic, who am I? Well, okay, since I'm the guy who makes it up, right? I'm the guy who puts it together. I'm the guy who designs the music. I'm the guy who designs the show. I would have to, I'd be the engineer in Titanic. I'm the guy who designed the ship. I'm Mr. Andrews. And there was my first character. And, and there is the person who can tell you, you know, how did they build Titanic, right? 
forty thousand, and and on and and I'm I'm now the expert, and now I have a character who I understand, and I understand what he what he's like trying to create something, and I understand his enthusiasm as he creates it, and then I understand the devastating consequence of his failure, his inability to realize his dream, and then his guilt on top of everything else. And so there he is. And then I see this, well, there's got to be a captain, he interviewed, right? And then I, I think about, well, who's on the ship? Who's on the ship is everybody I come from, my grandmother, my grandfather, my father, right? Everybody here in the United States. And, and why do they come here? For a better life. Get me aboard to call out my name. It's to America we aim to find a better life. We prayed you know, to, be, to be on this ship. And so oh. I had my people. And, and that's how I see what people want, what they would want to be, what does a person want, what will he or she do to get it. And that itself is a story. It's, we call it an I want song in the, in the language of musical theater. And, and then uh, and then they interact. Uh, and then why do they overreach? They overreach because they ask too much. Tom Sutherland directed the English production of Titanic, the musical. It's extraordinary because the medium of film, you can really see the faces very big. So you don't have to see some guy with a small mouth, you know, from the back of the theater. It's, it, and it's very immediate. And then it becomes, it becomes very clear that if all they had wanted to do was build a ship that wouldn't sink, they could have done that. But you see, there's also another element in, psych in, in society uh, and that's capitalism and greed and selfishness. And so also on the ship was the owner of the ship. And the owner of the ship thought, well, it's not only gotta be completely safe, but it's got to be for the sake of capitalism, for the sake of business, it's got to break the speed record. It's, why should you go on the Titanic? Well, because it's the fastest trip from one side of the ocean to the other. Before they even tested everything out, he insisted, he pushed on that maiden voyage. It's not enough that we have the greatest ship in the world, the most technology, brilliant ship in the world. It also has to be the fastest one. When I write a show like this, I do a tremendous amount of research. And of course, I found out they were going too fast. I found out uh, they they ignored radio warnings when there had been reports of iceberg. Oh, they, okay. They, they, they became overconfident. And so you see, on the one hand, you have the dream. And on the other hand, you have the greed. Mm. So, so greed and business, in that particular case, trumped care and sci scientific caution and that's why that happened but it ha and and you know what in the same way something must have happened up there with the challenger that somebody didn't get right mm. you know because it happened it mm. was a worthy dream it was a desire to create a ship that would save lives. Mm. The Challenger was a desire to make a perfect exploratory thing that would further human knowledge, right? Mm. Sometimes we dream, sometimes we fail. And so, mm. and so we have those two things in, 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 in both of those stories. Mm. And I just, it just made, it made me sing. Uh, are you saying that um, they could have avoided the iceberg, but yes. because they went faster? Yes. All of you, all of you, go see the show, and you'll see yeah. you'll see they were going too fast. They yeah. were being pushed too fast by the owner, who said we have to beat the speed record of. Yeah, uh, we see that in the movie. Yeah, I mean, in your show. Yeah. So I had okay. So now let's jump to uh, your um, your wonderful uh, news. You know, is that this gorgeous production? which I forgot was almost 10 years ago or something, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. absolutely beautiful. He's playing in, I think you said 750. It's, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary. It's in just, I, I was shocked, uh, really. It was just, it, it, and it was simply a movie of, of the show, but being able to see the faces that closely as they sing and as they emote and hear and everything. Also mm -hmm. having, a, having a, you know, a six camera shoot you know, where instead of watching a bunch of people on the stage and, you know, where, where's the sound coming from? You're getting close-ups, you're getting, it is, it, it's just a wonderful film. But, but it's more than that, because, you know, I really felt 
to be honest with you, it was kind of the first time. I, of course, I've seen I've seen thousands of musicals, but it was the first time that I was watching a musical in a movie theater, and really, you really feel immersed in the theater. You feel the audience it's, applauding around you, it's laughing. Immersed. It's not a Hollywood movie ma- based on a based on a musical. It's a musical filmed in in an exquisitely unique way. Mm. So moving, and it's captivating and and of course and then and then the, the performances are yeah. so brilliantly theatrical in, in the best way the band sounds wonderful wow. and yeah. i was just I, I i confess you know i i was really I, I was i was really surprised at the at the dimensions that film could bring to a, literally a stage show uh and i, I think we may i think it's an I think we may be seeing a lot of things like that now because uh, whoever did it did a wonderful job. Yeah. Oh, and 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 we need and of course we we give a big um, a big thank you to all the AMC theater and to Fathom oh. Events who oh. put all of that together. But we thank you most importantly for the music. So grateful, yes. well, I, I I let you go because you've been already very generous with with me. Um, what do you think is the future of of musicals? Do you think that because we live in the era of Netflix, of YouTube, having a lot of entertainment at home. And I see it even for my shows, it's harder and harder uh, to bring audiences while the shows are getting better, actually. Um, And there are more efforts done on the shows. We have special effects, we have new backgrounds, we have new, new stuff to make it better for the audience. People can buy a ticket on their phone. So everything is easier, but yet it's harder to bring audiences. So what do you think is the is the future of musicals, my dear Maury? I think that I think that the future of musicals is going to be explosion, an explosion that nobody ha- could ever have anticipated. And I can tell you that <clears throat> because when I when I started writing these things, there was a workshop created by this man named Lehman Engel. He created the BMI Music Theater Workshop, and some of the earliest people who attended that workshop were me and Edward Kleban and Alan Menken. And of course, Ed ended up writing a chorus line and I ended up what I did. And Alan, of course, ended up writing everything else. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> and, 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 but at the same time, when, when dear Lehman passed away, I took over that, that, that workshop and sat up in front and, and moderated it. Oh, I'm going to say probably for about 15, 16 years. And the people who came into that workshop at that time were Lynn Ahrens and Stephen Flaherty and Robert Lopez and Kristen uh, Anderson Lopez and and Jeff Marks and 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 so many of these brilliant geniuses who now have had musicals and they're and they're still coming into that workshop and they're still writing their things and that's just one little workshop and now of course it's become internationalized and we have new musicals from. Every country, and 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 you know, my my I there are more productions of my work in the country of Japan than any other country in the world. Korea is a, a, yeah. a wonderful area, uh, just all over the world, and so it's only a matter of time before they start writing their own shows. And so I think we haven't even begun to see the explosion of new musical theater, uh, and even local theater and community theater. So I, I, I think it's a. I think it's an exciting and burgeoning form because even better than the professional theater, we have amateur theaters. We have schools that do it all over the world. So if you think about it, uh, compared to opera, uh, even compared to film, there are more people doing musicals in professional groups, amateur groups, school groups, university groups, countries all over the world than ever before. What you did with Titanic is absolutely brilliant. And to bring it to movie theaters, because one thing that I started to get a little bit annoyed is that you're working so much to put a musical together. And at the end of the last performance, it's like, it's all over. There's no memory of it. So yeah. I think we should really film them. And, and I think it is true. Yeah. And by the way, encores, you know, the, well, you know, they're on at the yeah, yeah. 56th Street. They are there in their next season. They're, they're doing Titanic in, uh, oh, in, June, of, wow. uh, in June of 2024. And that's I amazing. That's quite wonderful, you know, because they do wonderful work. You know? Well, you're doing definitely wonderful work. You know, I will never forget, I was talking uh, 
I was in uh, in Dubai and they wanted to do Fiddler on the Roof over there, you know. Uh -huh. And 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 they said, what do you think of? And they mentioned your musical Phantom. Oh. And I said, oh, yeah, we have to do Phantom. Oh, that would be so easy. And, oh, and, you know, and so the guy. Dubai. I'd love to be big in Dubai. In, in Dubai. <laughs> no, no, but wait, what, what is funny is that, so you had the shake, you know, with the uh, yes. outfit, the Middle Eastern outfit. And, and he goes, is that story of the Phantom of Fidley on the Roof very famous in America? I said, <laughs> it's like the most famous thing yeah. in America. And then he goes, because... It is such a Middle Eastern story. Yes, it is, isn't it? Oh, that's so interesting. Because well, you know what? You know? Because what you write, my dear Maury, yeah. touches everybody. Because yeah. all the, you said, all these cultures that you have, they get to everybody. It's like a friend of mine who's a stand-up comedian. He said, when he does a show for this community, it's the same show. He just changes the names. That's you it. Know? Yes, but exactly. we're all the same after all, right? Yes, what's the human experience, you know, and that's 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 absolutely true. I used to be surprised when, you know, my stuff started being done in Japan 25 years ago. And I thought, gee, I know it's a different culture, but I was thrilled to see that. You've been so generous with me, my dear Maury. I can't thank you enough. It really, truly means the world to me. Thank you for all the beautiful music oh, that you are writing. I'm so I love, love you. I enjoy talking to you and having this. Oh, I love you from the bottom right. of my heart. And Ladies I love to everybody who, who has been coming to see these shows and, and uh, I love that you love musicals and keep keep going to them and keep writing them. Yeah, you are the sweetest. Thank you so much. And <laughs> to stage your work and to direct and to produce your work is one of the best. I wish it to everybody because the audience is happy and you're sold out all the time when there's more Yast on, on the playbill. So I recommend to all producers to, to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is David Sarira. I had the pleasure, the honor, the privilege today to have over the phone the very talented Mr. Maury Yeston, this legend. Uh, this is a special day on iHeartRadio, on the Culture News and many other platforms to host Mr. Maury Yeston. Go to run to movie theaters to see Titanic, the musicals. We give a big shout out to AMC Theater for putting it and also Fathom events and also my dear friends, uh, Kel Sherman, uh, we say hello to all the team, Scott, Logan and everybody for putting this together. Maury, a last word of, of, of goodbye? Yes, goodbye. Uh, uh, I wish everybody good health and, and, and just keep on singing. And we love you and we keep on singing your music. Have a lovely day. Thank you so much. <laughs>